now we're going to move to Johan Rockström, director of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, and he's also the professor at the Institute of Earth and Environmental Science at Potsdam University, and of course, um, renowned for introducing and giving us the frame of planetary boundaries. Um, over to you, Johan. Well, thanks, Andrew, and, and great to be with you. And uh, from my side as well, congratulations to this uh, not only timely, but extraordinarily important report on a 1.5 degree lifestyles and really taking a full stab at the integrated transformation and the equity dimensions. And I'd like to start by just, you know, sharing or, or rather reminding us of, of uh, where, where science is standing today, that 1.5, which up until quite recently could be, you know, perceived as being some, some form of uh, compromise with the low-lying island states in the dark late hour negotiations in Paris, in fact, today has ample, I would even argue unequivocal scientific support for being a real climate planetary boundary. We actually put the climate planetary boundary already in 2009, well below 1.5. It was actually set at roughly 1.2, recognizing that we have aerosol cooling and so many other greenhouse gases that would be equating to something around 1.5 degrees Celsius of global mean temperature. We have the IPCC 6 assessment report that now confirms that already at 1.1 degrees Celsius warming, we are feeling really serious damage for communities and economies around the world, but that we're also at risk of irreversible commitments on the Arctic in the West Antarctic ice shelf, in the Atlantic overturning of heat, the AMOC on tropical coral reef systems, 1.5 is, is a biophysically established planetary boundary for climate. We may be able to manage ourselves in a, in a temporary overshoot beyond it, but it's, it's today actually at a point where if we reach two and go beyond two, we are you know, entering unknown domain. We're entering a space we haven't seen for the past three million years. And we are at risk of, of really pushing away the Earth system from what we can call livable conditions that can take a fair responsibility for the world with civilizations as we define it. Now, the, the real big drama here is that the only way to, to land safely within 1.5 degrees Celsius is not to phase out fossil fuels alone, but it, a safe landing requires that we return within a safe operating space of all the planetary boundaries. That is the big challenge for this year in Glasgow. That has to sink in. In fact, we published recently in the Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences an analysis showing that already today, if we hadn't had the resilience in nature, just on terrestrial ecosystems on land, we would have crashed through 1.5 already. Just the resilience in temperate and boreal forest and wetlands, soils and, and tropical forests have already buffered half a degree. But we also know that if we continue losing the cracks as we are seeing more and more signs of, we are at risk of having self-amplifying impacts from the planetary boundaries outside of climate, the biosphere boundaries that could actually push ourselves away from any chance of delivering on Paris. Just look at the latest signs on the Brazilian part of the Amazon rainforest, which over just the last 10 years has tipped over from being one of the most precious carbon sinks on planet Earth to now being a carbon source. It's actually emitting. The richest biome on Earth is emitting more greenhouse gases than it is absorbing. This is, I would argue, like, like the signal to humanity that we are not only in an urgency point, but that a safe landing requires fair lifestyles within a safe operating space of a 1.5 degrees Celsius Earth system. It's not only about oil, coal, and natural gas, it is about biodiversity, fresh water, nitrogen, phosphorus cycles, land systems, all the aerosols and chemical pollutants in the same systems analysis. So the planetary boundary framework really translates into the ultimate definition of fairness, I would argue, meaning that the ultimate responsibility that we have as a adult generation on watch on earth today is to hand over a planet to our children and their children 
which is at least in the same livable properties as the planet where we were ourselves born. Isn't that the ultimate definition of justice? Isn't that what 1.5 degrees Celsius lifestyles should fundamentally land in? This, this equitable handing over of a planet, which is in a stability domain that can support human civilizations into the future. So what does all this imply? Well, it implies something that is so well articulated in this report, namely that we need a fundamental value shift because if we have the risk of transgressing biophysically hardwired tipping points in the Earth system, it of course leads to setting up guardrails, boundaries, which translates to finite budgets of natural assets, as pointed out, for example, in, in the most important economic analysis, I would argue that we have recently, the Patharas Gupta report for the UK government. Now, this is hard sustainability, but we've come to that point. This is what we need. And that is what really translates to justice, because that means we have a finite global carbon budget. We have a finite freshwater budget. We have a finite budget of nitrogen and phosphorus and so on. And that this has to be shared in an equitable way. And this report in a, in a you know, what I would argue to be the sharpest way so far can really build up a methodology of how that space should be shared and can be shared. Now the drama or, or challenge is that this as uh, Sandrine and myself and many others are working on today, translates to exponential transformative pathways. There's no such thing anymore as incrementality. With the KR Foundation, we have quite recently, as you may know, supported the first behavioral change integrated science commission led by Professor Peter Newell and his colleagues at Sussex, showing that you know, nudging along incremental pathways will not do the job. We're now at a point where we need these big turnarounds that Sandrine were referring to, which is something we're working on in the Earth for All initiative that will be presenting its results with the Stockholm Plus 50. It all boils together to this need of in integrating Earth system science with equity, with transformative change. Now, do we have amplifying feedbacks to close this that can kind of support us in this direction? Well, I think one of the most important positive amplifying feedbacks, which again is so well described in this report, is that a landing zone within a safe operating space of a manageable, stable, and resilient planet is actually a journey, not only of equity, but it's a journey of opportunity. It's a journey of next steps in modernity in terms of health, food security, avoiding displacement, migration, conflicts, and ultimately social stability. So we have something really fundamental here. We have a crisis. It's an integrated crisis. It requires taking on the full earth system in a, in a fair and just way, which we've never been able to do before. The limits to growth warned us already then, 50 years have gone, and we've so far you know, failed humanity in this respect. But we're also seeing, luckily, the emergence of so much evidence that we have the solutions that now can be scaled to start truly delivering a 1.5 degree lifestyle within the safe operating space of a stable and resilient 1.5 degrees Celsius Earth system. And this report is an important piece in that work.